Hi, this is Dr. A again. So let's talk lymphatic system and immunity in this chapter. All right, so the lymphatic system is a network of vessels that assist the circulation of body fluids. So we, uh, in the previous lesson, covered the circulatory system, and we talked about fluids entering the, into the capillary beds and um, most of it, you know, returning to the venous system but some of it being left behind to in the tissue bed to then enter the lymphatic system. So lymphatic vessels collect and carry away this excess fluid from this inter, the interstitial spaces, which is the spaces between the cells and tissues. Um, and there are also special vessels called lacteals. So think lacto milk, right? Um, these vessels uh, look white uh, and it's because they transport fats to the circulatory system. So what happens in the digestive system around the intestines is that the, the fat molecules are to, um, assembled in my cells and my cells are too big to enter into the capillary circulation. Therefore, they enter into lymphatic capillary circulation and um, they look white because they're, there's just nothing but fat molecules there. And so they're called lacteal because they look white and milk is white. So there you go. Uh, the organ cells and biochemicals of the lymphatic system help uh, defend against disease. All right, so let's look at the lymphatic pathways. So they start as lymphatic capillaries uh, that merge to form larger vessels that empty into the veins uh, in the thoracic cavity. So if you think about it, think of it as a parallel alternate pathway for just fluids, right? Um, that uh, will connect the, the tissues of the body back to the venous system. And then the lymphatics, if you will, parallel the venous system. Now it is um, a closed ended system. So they have like little finger like projections, little dead end tubes that are in the, the, around the capillary bed and in the tissues and stuff. And those um, capillaries pick up excess fluid and move it through the lymphatic vessels and stuff. Um, the, the walls of these lymphatic capillaries are thin and there's also slits in those walls that allow the fluid to quickly enter these lymphatic capillaries. Um, once the fluid has entered the lymphatic capillaries and the lymphatic vessels, that fluid is called lymph and not tissue fluid. Okay, so the wall of these lymphatic vessels are much thinner than that of the veins, but have the same three layers and they also have the semilunar valves because they have the same job of returning that fluid up against uh, gravity and stuff. The larger lymphatic vessels will pass through lymph nodes uh, and then they more merge together to form what we call lymphatic trunks. The lymphatic trunks then drain lymph from the body and are named after the regions that they drain. And we're going to look at those here in a second. But these trunks join one or uh, of one or of two, sorry, one of two collecting ducts. They're either on the, the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct. And that is where they are dumping the fluid back into the venous system. And it's really close to the point where it returns back to the heart. Uh, so the right lymphatic duct drains the right side of the head, the neck, the right arm, and the right thorax into the right subclavian vein. And the thoracic duct drains the rest of the body into the left subclavian vein. So you see them represented here. Um, so uh, right side of the head, right side of the, the thorax here, but the right arm and all that, and then it draws, goes into the right subclavian. Whereas uh, the rest of the body, so the bottom part of the body, left side, all into the thoracic duct. And um, so here's the diagram again. We, we saw this one in the cardiovascular system, starting the heart in the arteries and veins and all of that. And you can see, so the lymphatic network here is, is not a closed loop like the cardiovascular system. It is a dead end loop that picks up excess fluid and just moves it into, back to the venous circulation close to where it returns back into the heart. Okay, so first question. So why do you think surgeons inspect and remove lymph nodes in certain cancer cases? So think of a mastectomy where they take some of the lymph nodes out in this area. So uh, if you don't know, look it up, but answer that for me. 
So uh, tissue fluid then comes lymph when it has, once it has entered the lymphatic capillary. And of course, lymph formation, formation completely depends on tissue fluid formation. So if you have a lot of tissue fluid formation, you should have a lot of lymph fluid forming. Um, the tissue fluid is made up of water and the dissolved substances that leave the blood capillaries by filtration and diffusion. So it would have a certain amount of amino acids and glucose and other molecules. It would also have waste molecules too. Uh, the plasma proteins create that plasma osmotic pressure that draws the fluid back to the capillaries, but it's not 100%. And therefore the fluid that does not return back to the capillaries and enters the venous system then will become tissue fluid and that tissue fluid will become lymphatic fluid as it enters into the lymphatics. So, um, Part of what moves the, the, that tissue fluid into the lymphatic is a rising osmotic pressure in the tissues. Um, and so that is what interferes with the return of the fluid into the blood to the bloodstream uh, and um, instead would have to divert it to the lymphatic system. So increasing tissue fluid hydrostatic pressure force forces some of the fluid into the lymphatic capillaries. So basically your tissues can only hold so much fluid and just the presence of excess fluid or, or, or more and more fluid arriving of, with each heartbeat automatically pushes some of it into the lymphatics because it has to have somewhere to go. And it's kind of like the path of least resistance. So as I said, remember that there, there's some slits, the, the capillaries are thinner in the lymphatics, so it's easier for it to just receive this excess fluid. Okay, so uh, the hydrostatic pressure of tissue fluid drives the entry of lymph into the lymphatic capillaries, which is what I just explained. Forces that move blood in the veins, which we talked about in the last lesson, which are skeletal muscle contraction in breathing movements, um, and the contraction of the smooth muscles in the walls of the lymphatic trunks are the forces that propel lymph through the lymphatic vessels. So the same thing that, that helps move the uh, venous blood moves the lymphatic fluid. A condition that interferes with the flow of lymph will result in edema. And here's a picture of edema in uh, a foot. And the way you know a patient has edemas is if you, you press down into the swelling, if it stays indented, right, then that is uh, edema. That it signifies that there is excess tissue fluid. Um, and... Um, Part of that could be because uh, lymphatic vessels or lymphatic tissues could have been removed or disturbed, and that could result in edema. So if you don't have good lymph flow, um, you will have you'll have um, tissue fluid staying behind and swelling and causing edema. So uh, lymphatic tissue contains lymphocytes, macrophages, and other cells. So um, lymphatic tissue that's associated with uh, the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive systems is called the malt mucosa associated lymphatic tissue and is part of our protection against bacteria and infections and stuff like that. Uh, and that type of lymphatic tissue, those lymph nodes that are scattered all over there is uh, diffuse and unencapsulated. So it's, it's all over um, those areas. Uh, your tonsils, your appendix, and your payers patches are compact masses of lymphatic tissue, and they're called lymph nodules. Um, and your lymphatic organs include your lymph nodes, the thymus, and the spleen. Okay, so let's talk about the lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes, which contain lymphocytes and macrophages, are uh, located along lymphatic vessels. So as the fluid returns, uh, it's trying to return back to the venous system, it will move automatically through these, think stop points, waypoints, they're going to be these lymph nodes it's gonna have to move through. And as it moves through these lymph nodes, it's going to be checked and filtered and those lymphocytes and macrophages will remove any kind of uh, bacteria and viruses and things like that and be activated. So, um, if you look at the shape of a lymph node, they usually are bean-shaped with blood vessels, nerves, and uh, efferent lymphatic vessels attached to the indented hilum, right? So here's the indented hilum. And um, so, and with the afferent uh, lymphatic vessels entering on the convex surface, which is right here. Okay, so convex like this, like bent, right? Convex. And then the hilum is the other indentation. So think of a kidney bean kind of shape. 
Um, so here's the indentation helium, and then here's the um, convex surface right there. So uh, one way to think about it, so you have these afferent vessels are arriving. So afferents and efferents sound really close. So afferent starts with an A, efferent starts with an E. And the trick to remembering um, what's what is you'll see that afferent is always arriving, stuff that's arriving to the area, and efferent is E exit, is stuff that's exiting the area. So in the case of our lymphatics here, your afferent vessels are bringing the fluid here, the lymphatic fluid, to the lymph node. It's flowing through right here. So you, know, you have germinal centers. This is where all the macrophages and um, lymphocytes and all that are located. And so this fluid is being filtered through this lymph node. And then, um, then it will exit through the hilum where you have the efferent, the exit, flow and it will keep flowing there through this set of uh, lymphatic vessels and then it'll connect to another lymph node etc etc okay so lymph nodes are covered with connective tissue that connective tissue does in extend inside the nodules here and forms sinuses uh, spaces so just think of like cubicles in an office basically uh, and divides them up and like that and creates spaces uh, and uh, these contain, these spaces then contain uh, lymphocytes and macrophages, which clean the lymph as it flows through the lymph node. <clears throat> so in this picture, uh, again, it's to draw it. We see you've had a couple of these. So you can, again, change color, thickness, and then you can draw, right? So um, the instructions are saying where are the efferent lymphatic vessels. So circle them. You can pick a color. I pick blue. It doesn't matter what color you pick, but circle your efferent lymphatic vessels in this picture. Okay, so um, lymph nodes generally occur in chains along parts of the larger lymphatic vessels. The major area where you find lymph nodes are your cervical, right, um, thoracic, uh, and the thorax, right, area, um, um, axillary, axillary's armpit, uh, area, uh, supratrochlear, abdominal, pelvic, and inguinal. So those I can't really point to, but you can see them here in this picture. So supratrochlear, so here in your arm, right? Abdominal, and the abdominal area is pretty easy. Pelvic and the pelvic area. And then uh, inguinal, so it's the groin area. Note that there aren't any lymph nodes um, noted in the legs. They're more like centrally located, but there are some here in the arms. Um, anyway, an average person has 500 to 700 lymph nodes scattered all over their body um, and doing the job of filtering that lymphatic fluids. So the macrophages and lymphocytes within the lymph nodes filter the lymph and remove bacteria and any kind of cellular debris before the lymph is returned to the blood so that it is clean when it returns to the blood. The lymph nodes are also centers of lymphocyte production and these cells function in what we call immune surveillance. So they are looking for um, bacteria and viruses and things that don't belong that need to be remo removed and fought against. The thymus uh, is a soft bilobed organ. So it has two lobes, right? And it's behind the sternum, which is your breastbone, uh, above the heart. It shrinks in size during the lifetime. So it is large in children and it's really small in the elderly. The reason being is I will kind of refer to the thymus as um, the training academy or the training school for your T lymphocytes. And your T lymphocytes are, uh, we're going to talk about them, are a big part of your immune system. Um, and your immune system, when you're born, has to be educated and taught um, how to fight off bacteria, how to fight off viruses, what, you know, which ones are the bad ones, which ones are the good ones and stuff like that. And so um, when you start your life as a child, you have a lot to learn. So you have a big school, uh, you have a big thymus. But as you encounter infections and stuff like that and learn to fight them off and develop your immune system, you get less sick as you get older. Uh, and that thymus at school just kind of shrinks because it's not needed as much. Um, the thymus is surrounded by a connective tissue capsule um, that extends inside of it and, of course, also divides it into lo lobules similar to the lymph node. 
Those lobules contain lymphocytes, some of which mature into T lymphocytes. So T cells or T lymphocytes come from the thymus, T, 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 right? You can see that. Uh, and those uh, T lymphocytes uh, help provide immunity. The thymus also secretes hormones called thymosins, uh, and those hormones influence the maturation of those T lymphocytes. So in this diagram of the thoracic cavity and part of the abdominal cavity, so you have your diaphragm right here, your lungs, your heart, uh, your sternum is not represented, but here is your thymus right here. This is your thyroid. So this is your thymus. Uh, so again, bigger and children smaller um, as you become older. And then the spleen. Uh, the spleen lies in the upper left abdominal cavity, and it is the body's largest lymphatic organ. It resembles a large lymph node, except that it contains blood instead of lymph. So it's kind of specialized. Um, it does have some of the same function, though. So as a lymph nodes would filter and clean lymphatic fluid, the spleen filters and cleans blood. Um, so it is composed of white pulp, that has white blood cells, most of them lymphocytes, um, red pulp, which contains red cells, but also some macrophages and some lymphocytes. And uh, it filters that blood and removes damaged blood cells and bacteria. So remember in your blood chapter, your red blood cells only live about 120 days. So when they get old and broken down, they have to be removed. And so the spleen is the filter that catches all of these old red cells and removes them from circulation and breaks them, helps break them down because the macrophages help break them down. Okay, so um, in this little activity. So you have this uh, representation of the thoracic and abdominal cavities. I want you to draw the thymus. So you don't have to get too, super complicated. Just draw a representation of the thymus in its proper location. And uh, I want you to find the spleen in here. So you may have to refer to in your book and all of that. It's kind of hidden and tucked away, but uh, just draw a circle around its location. Okay, so um, body defenses against infection. So um, disease causing agents also called pathogens. So patho is disease, gen to generate. So to generate disease, there you go. Uh, these can produce infections within the body. Now uh, it's worth noting, not all viruses and not all um, bacteria and fungi are pathogens. So they don't all cause diseases. Um, but for those that do cause disease, the body has two lines of defense against pathogens. There's the innate, which is our, the non-specific kind of already built-in defenses that guard against any pathogen and they respond rapidly. And uh, they're part of your makeup. Of, we're going to cover some of those. And then you have the adaptive specific defenses, which is really what we mean when we refer to immunity. And these mount a very specific response, again, a specific target, um, and develop antibodies in memory and stuff, okay? So um, it sees a, a certain virus, and it will react exactly to that virus, make, make antibodies that are specific to that virus. And then if your body sees that virus again later, it will remember that virus and know what to do with it, to the point that where you won't even have symptoms. So um, this, my video is muted, so I'm going to comment this video. This is a really fun video. It's called Flu Attack. It's an NPR, NPR video. I believe I have it in your content, uh, but you can find it on YouTube. And so um, this is a representation. Uh, we're going to see um, a graphic of uh, what happens when, uh, so this person sneezed uh, and they're sick with a flu and their sneeze droplet has a whole bunch of viruses in it. So um, we talk about flu, but we could say coronavirus, right? So you have that sneeze droplet, and you have this person that is sitting here that was nearby, and here the viruses enter their throat. So these are the little two guys that are doing the animation, um, and they're just talking back and forth here for just a second. But uh, so the virus is going to dock onto the throat cell, and it uses these little spikes, uh, and there are receptors on the throat cells that match the spikes on the surface of the virus. And these spikes 
they kind of um, function as keys, and these are the lock, and the key fits into the lock uh, on the surface of the cells, which then allows that virus to enter the cell. By the way, viruses can only ever enter the cells if they have the right lock and key mechanism to enter that uh, specific cell. The cell doesn't know that it's a virus or a foe. It thinks it's something that's supposed to be entering the cell because it, you know, undid the lock. And so it brings it in. Uh, and the virus bursts, and those are the little building blocks of the viruses, and then these are, this is the genetic material of the virus. In this instance, the virus is an RNA virus, and it's going to go into the nucleus. So here's your nucleus inside your cell, so it enters a nucleus, and then it's going to come across a polymerase um, enzyme here that is basically going to copy the genetic material because that's what it does. That's its function in the body. It helps to copy. And so it's going to uh, make duplicate copies of the viral genetic material. And then that viral genetic material, as it makes copy after copy after copy, is going to go to the ribosomes. And the ribosomes are going to cook up the proteins that are needed to reassemble new viruses. Those proteins are going there, pick up the genetic material, all assemble. Here's the other proteins they assemble back into virus. And then if they have an envelope, they'll pick up a part of the uh, cell membrane with new little keys that are also made with the genetic material. And uh, one enters and a whole bunch of them exit. And then as that happens, of course, that throat cell is destroyed. Um, and what he's talking about is about, you know, all of these viruses coming in, but we have a whole bunch of cells. So the fact that it destroys a cell, it's still the, the damage is minimum because that's how many cells we have. Of course, our immune system, so this is like a white cell and it can grab it and just pull it in and eat it. And then all these little things floating here are antibodies. And so antibodies can coat uh, the virus services to then prevent the keys from docking onto the receptors. So you see them coating there. Uh, and the coating of the virus with the antibodies, of course, make the white cells also eat them. So anyway, so that's, that's part of how uh, I thought this was a really good video for you, for you guys to see. So uh, let's talk a little bit about our, first our innate nonspecific defenses against infection. First one is species resistance. So this is something that you kind of already know. Um, a species is resistant to diseases that affect other species because it has a unique chemical environment or temperature that fails to provide the right conditions required by the pathogens of another species. Now, there are some pathogens that can cross species and affect uh, mammals. For example, rabies is one that can cross. It can go from humans to animals, to your dog, to your cat, to a raccoon, to something. Anyway, so some of them can cross species. But there's things like, for example, um, fel feline, um, I was going to say H feline, HIV or HPV or something like that. There's, there are several feline viruses that have zero impact on us. They, uh, there's doggy parvo. Doggy parvo would not cause um, any kind of disease in you. And so part of that is that lock and key system of the viruses. Um, you don't, you just don't have, uh, the viruses have the key, but you don't have the right locks. And so basically there's no way for it, nowhere for it to dock on your body to enter any of your cells. And so it can't have any effect or any disease, um, cause any disease in your body. So uh, that's one. Um, so simply species resistance. There's a set of diseases uh, that humans can get. There are sets of diseases that dogs could get, etc. The other one, very common, of course, is your mechanical barriers. So uh, unbroken skin and your mucous membranes that are barriers to prevent things from entering into your body. So uh, that's why it's important, especially if you're in healthcare, if you have any kind of wounds on your hands or arms or anywhere that's going to be exposed to make sure you cover them because it could be an entry point for pathogens. Um, the mechanical barriers also include your hair, mucus, and sweat. So mucus is meant to trap bacteria and viruses and move them out of the body. Sweat is meant to flush things off your body. Hair also prevents things from getting on your body. Uh, and so that is a first line of defense. So it's kind of like the, 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 the first barriers to prevent things from going into the body. 
So uh, the rest of the innate defenses are part of what we call the second line of defense. So first line of defense is block entry, right? Okay, so second line of defense is um, if for some reason uh, there has been entry, they are uh, a, a second uh, layer, if you will, of protection. So chemical barriers are number one. So chemical barriers are, for example, the highly acidic and caustic environment provided by gastric juice. So anything that you swallow, uh, you have gastric juice that's a really low pH, um, and so it can very easily dissolve bacteria and junk and stuff. Um, or the lysozyme in tears uh, that can kill many pathogens and stuff. You also have um, some of those things, enzymes and stuff on your skin. Um, and there's also interferons, which are hormone-like uh, hormone peptides that are produced by white cells that are antiviral. And um, they are produced by cells when they are infected with viruses and induce your nearby cells to produce antiviral enzymes that protect them from infection. They also stimulate phagocytosis, which is the eating uh, of the white cells eating the, the pathogens, right? And then uh, complement is another chemical, so activation of complement. Uh, complement stimulates inflammation, attracts phagocytes, and enhances phagocytosis. It also as denoted here, uh, when complement binds onto a bacterial cell, it can blow holes into the bacteria and cause it to basically disintegrate. So we have a lot of chemical defenses on our side. Um, and then we have some cells that are nonspecific. So natural killer cells um, are a type of lymphocytes that defend the body against various viruses and, viruses and cancer um, and so it kind of has a, you're a bad guy, I know you're a bad guy, or you're a bad cell, I don't care what you are specifically, you're gone, okay? Um, and so it can secrete what are called cytolytic substances, so it can destroy cells that are infected with viruses or cells that are cancer cells. Um, and the, the, the cytolytic substances are called perforins, so they perforate holes and cause the cell to basically implode. Um, and so you have natural killer cells. Again, they do not have to have specific programming and they're not specific to uh, one type of pathogens. Um, and they can also secrete chemicals that can enhance inflammation and inflammation is a protective mechanism. So then inflammation as a protective mechanism uh, is a tissue response to a pathogen and it's usually characterized by redness, swelling, heat, and pain. So you can see here like, uh, and sometimes itching. So like a mosquito bite or a wound and stuff. Um, the major actions that occur during the inflammation response uh, include the dilation of the blood vessels and bringing more blood to the area, the increase in, of blood volume in the affected area, the invasion of white cells in the area, blood clotting um, to prevent uh, blood leaving the body, right? And uh, their appearance of fibroblasts and the production of uh, their fibers and stuff in the area to repair the area. So um, those, and those are all protective. Part of the idea of inflammation is to wall off the area that has been affected, bring all the blood supply and stuff to that area so it can effectively fight off any infections and re rebuild anything that needs to be rebuilt and, and return back to normal. So some more innate nonspecific defenses. We have phagocytosis. So um, you, you have two types of phagocytes, your neutrophils and the monocytes. Uh, the monocytes, once they uh, leave the bloodstream, are called macrophages. But both uh, neutrophils and monocytes can leave the blood um, circulation and go into the tissues. And that process is called diapodesis. So uh, the fact that it can wander around the body. They are attracted to the injury area by what are called chemotaxis. So some of those chemicals that are released when there is an injury attract white cells to that area. So your neutrophils and your monocytes. And your neutrophils engulf smaller particles uh, and monocytes attack larger ones. And they just they eat them like Pac-Man like. They just whoosh, engulf it, bring it in, and break it down. And so phagocytosis also um, removes foreign particles from the lymph. Um, again, monocytes give rise to macrophages, which become fixed in various tissues.
Um, and so if they're in a tissue, if they're, if they're in the blood, we call them monocytes. If they're in tissue, we'll call them macrophage, but it's the same cell that has the same function. Uh, and then fever is another nonspecific defense. So fever interferes with the proper conditions that promote bacterial growth. So the bacteria don't like it. And during fever, the amount of iron in the blood is also reduced. Uh, and bacteria like iron, they need iron to reproduce. So it, we take it, it, your body hides it and takes it away from them. Uh, and so um, that depletes the nutrient for the bacteria. And so the bacteria or pathogens can't grow. And then also your phagocytic cells, so like your neutrophils and your macrophages can attack with greater vigor. Uh, so they're, they, it, it makes them even more active and better at what they're doing when the temperature uh, is, rises uh, with fever. So uh, this is a matchup. So just uh, match up these guys, uh, whether they're first line, second line, third line. Um, so in the second line, we have chemical um, we have second line antiviral chemical, etc. So just uh, match them up best you can. Again, when you click on them, if they turn green, you're good. If they're red, try something else. Um, and then, so let's go into our adaptive or specific defenses, or what we refer to as immunity. So your third line of defense, if a pathogen has managed to make it through the first and second line. Um, so it refers to the response mounted by the body against specific recognized foreign molecules, and that is immunity. Um, the antigens are proteins, polysaccharides, glycoproteins, or glycolipids that can el elicit an immune response. So that is an antigen um, is a molecule that an antibody can be made to. Before birth, the body makes an inventory of the self proteins of what it's supposed what's supposed to be there right uh, and other large molecules that are supposed to be there okay and then then once it, it knows everything that's supposed to be there anything that appears that looks foreign then it may attack and mount an immune response against so antigens are generally larger and more complex molecules such as proteins so proteins are very antigenic uh, but sometimes a small molecule called a haptin can combine with a larger molecule like a protein like albumin and then become antigenic. So uh, certain drugs that normally people don't react to if they're transported on proteins, that protein drug complex could cause, uh, where that drug is a haptin, that could become antigenic and then you can develop uh, reactions there to, to the drug. Okay, so... First poll question, uh, so which of these is an antigen? So um, you have choices between lipopolysaccharides from bacterial cell walls, an anti-A antibody, IgA, or glucose. Which one of those would be an antigen? Okay, so where do lymphocytes originate? Where did it come from? Because these, uh, the lymphocytes are the key players in your adaptive defense. So during fetal development, your red bone marrow starts releasing lymphocytes into the circulation. So 70 to 80% of those lymphocytes will become T lymphocytes, the T cells, and the remainder of which will become B lymphocytes or B cells. And we're gonna look at each one of these. Undifferentiated lymphocytes that reach the thymus will become T cells. And uh, the ones that stay in the bone marrow and mature up will become B cells, B cells for bone marrow. So B cells mature in the bone marrow, T cells mature in the thymus, okay? Uh, and then both B and T cells can uh, reside in your lymphatic organs, such as your lymph nodes, your spleen, uh, et cetera. So um, the T cells and the cellular immune response. So we're going to look at the job of T cells. So um, the activation of a T cell requires the presence of an antigen presenting cell. A macrophage is an example of an antigen presenting cell, uh, but a B cell can be an antigen presenting cell too. Um, and so um, the macrophage does what the macrophage does, which is to patrol the body and look for stuff that doesn't belong. When it finds something that doesn't belong, it, it engulfs it and it breaks that in the, the, let's say the particle, the bacteria into, into pieces and those pieces are antigens. And then it takes that antigen piece and it goes and shows it to a T cell and says, look, I present you with an antigen of something I have found that I think doesn't belong. Okay. 
So in order for a T cell to become activated, it must first encounter the macrophage that displays the antigen and it shows it to the macrophage shows it to the T cell on a major histocompatibility complex protein. So a display protein, if you will. And um, if the antigen fit in the T cells, antigen receptors and stuff, then it becomes activated. In this little diagram here, you actually have the macrophage here and the T cells. And you see one's on top of the other. They actually are interacting and talking back and forth, uh, binding the these receptors and stuff. And that uh, macrophage is showing that antigen to that T cell. So uh, once a T cell is activated by that antigen presenting cells, uh, it will interact directly uh, again, so it's activated directly by the antigen uh, um, presenting cells, um, you will get a cellular immune response or what we call cell-mediated uh, immunity. So uh, what T cells are responsible for is destroying cells that are infected with the pathogen or the virus or, some, or something like that. So T cells synthesize and secrete cytokines or cytokines however you want to say it, that will enhance cellular responses to antigens. Um, there are subcategories of T cells. So you have a helper T cell, which stimulates your B cells to produce antibodies. We're going to cover B cells here in just a, in a second. To, and those antibodies will be specific to that antigen that was presented to that T cell, right? Uh, and then the helper T cell can also activate it, your cytotoxic T cells, and the cytotoxic T cells continually monitor the body cells, recognizing and eliminating tumor cells and virus infected cells. So it's looking for the cells that have been affected either by cancer or by the pathogen that was recognized. So um, the cytokines from the helper T cells can activate your cytotoxic T cells, which then clone and multiply and make bunches and bunches of cytotoxic T cells. Um, it will bind also to antigen-bearing cells and release perforins. So if it finds a, a, a cell that's infected with that virus because it's displaying the, some of the virus parts on its surface, that cytotoxic C cells comes, binds into it, secretes chemicals, and those chemicals cause that infected cell to basically implode and die. So there you go. It's like, I'm sorry, you're infected. You must die. Uh, and then there are also uh, memory T cells that are formed that can provide a no delay response to any future exposure of the same antigen or the same pathogen. Therefore, if it sees it again later, five years later, a year later, whatever, it will immediately destroy it and you probably won't even have any symptoms at all. So um, this diagram um, shows this um, whole process. Um, so we're going to focus here, especially. So you have, this is your macrophage. It ate a bacteria, it broke it down, took the antigen, put it on its MHC thing, and you have a uh, cytotoxic T cells that's talking to it and a helper T cell that's talking to it, and they get activated to that displayed antigen. The helper T cell is going to go activate uh, uh, as it is activated, it's going to secrete cytokines and activate a uh, B cell. We're going to talk about the B cells here in a minute. And uh, it is also going to activate the cytotoxic T cells, which is then going to be specific to this pathogen that was encountered. And then some of these will differentiate, will clone and make more T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and some of them will clone and make memory T cells that will hang out for decades and always carry the memory of that antigen and be able to respond to it. Okay, so let's look at B cells. We mentioned B cells a couple times. So they do what we call the humoral uh, immune response. Um, humors being fluids, um, humoral res immune response basically refers to antibody productions. So uh, a B cell may, can become activated and produce a clone of um, itself when its antigen receptor encounters its matching antigen. So if it has been made against a specific antigen and it sees that antigen, all of a sudden it starts cloning, okay, and it's activated. But most of you, your B cells will need your helper T cells to be activated. When a helper T cell encounters a B cell, 
that has itself encountered an antigen to help her T cells release cytokines that can activate that B cell so it can divide and form clones. So the helper T cell is kind of a general coordinating the armies. It coordinates the cytotoxic T cells, it talks to the macrophages, it activates the B cells. It's a very key um, player in this whole system. And incidentally, the virus HIV is, it destroys the cell. It destroys the helper T cell. And that is why it is so destructive to the immune system because the helper T cell is needed for so many, uh, in, in so many interactions for the immune system to write, to work, uh, right and correctly. So, um, some of the B cells, once they're activated and start cloning, will form what we call plasma cells. Uh, which produce and secrete antibodies, which are also known as immunoglobulins. And so a plasma cell will have this like fried egg with an increased like amount of plasma uh, look here, whereas a normal lymphocyte has very little plasma. So, uh, and the reason that this is growing is because the endoplasmic reticulum grows because it becomes a big old protein factory because it's, um, the protein that it's producing is an antibody. Antibodies also known as immunoglobulins. Same thing, word, uh, word used interchangeably. Like the T cells, some of the B cells become memory cells and they can re respond to future encounters with the same antigen. Your um, antibody mediated response, immune response is called your humoral immune response. So there are B cells making antibodies uh, that are little um, proteins that can bind onto the bacteria and viruses and stuff and interfere with its function. So in a little diagram, you have your little bacteria, your antigen, it got, it, it docked and matched this receptor on the surface of a B cell, which got activated. Cytokines from that helper T cell help activate it. And then it proliferates. So it clones itself. And uh, out of the clones, some become plasma cells, which are big antibody factories, and some become memory B cells, which hang out for, again, decades um, and provide protection long term. So uh, here's another little matching. So um, match what the cell does. And again, if it's green, you got it right. So let's talk antibodies. There are five types of antibodies or five types of immunoglobulins. Um, and um, they are the gamma globulin fraction of plasma and uh, some of the other uh, proteins in plasma are like albumin, if you will. So um, IgG is uh, the most abundant one. It is in tissue fluid and in plasma. It defends, your cell, uh, defends you against bacterial cells, viruses, and toxin, and it can activate complement. It looks like this, a single little Y right here, where the active uh, pieces are right here. Those are the ones that are specific to that antigen, to that bacteria or that virus. And this tail end uh, doesn't vary, and it's, but it's a flag for um, the macrophages or other cells to, to eat it once it has captured a bacteria or a virus. So this one is the most abundant. Um, the production of this um, one takes a few days to get going, uh, but once that thing gets going, your symptoms will go way down because um, then it'll be like winning the battle against um, the, the virus or bacteria. IgA is uh, uh, found in exocrine gland secretions, so breast milk, saliva, tears, nasal fluids, gastric fluids, intestinal juice, bile, and urine. And it's protective in those um, mucous or secretions there. Uh, it is a dimer, so it's actually two of the little Ys with the tails, tail end bound together. So again, IgA is protective in a lot of the mucus um, things and mucus and secretions that are, that are made. IgM is uh, found in plasma and activates complement and also reacts with white blood cells during transfusions. So your anti-A antibodies, anti-B antibodies that we were talking about are IgM, your ABO uh, uh, antibodies. By the way, your RH antibodies are IgG. Um, and so IgM, it looks like a snowflake. It's five of the Ys with the tails put together. It's a big one. And there's some IgM that's also part of your innate immune uh, system too. That's just like non-specific against pathogens. 
Um, IgD is found on the surface of mo most B lymphocytes. So it looks like the little Y, but the tail is embedded on the surface of the B lymphocyte. It functions in B cell activations. And then IgE is found in exocrine gland secretions also, um, and uh, so, so as listed up here, but it um, promotes allergic reactions. So IgE actually looks like IgG, but its tail end is longer, uh, and it has a different um, type of effect because it triggers allergy or allergic reactions. Okay, so match each of the uh, antibody types to what they do. Okay, so your antibody actions, um, the what do these guys do? So there's a direct attack by agglutination. So the antibodies, as they link up on the viruses or the bacteria, can cross link to each other and cause basically big clumps there. Um, they can cause precipitation, which makes them they solidify in the plasma, and then uh, the you know white cells can uh, engulf them, or the neutralization of the antigen. So that's what I was referring to when I was talking about like the virus. You know, and with the keys, if the keys are coated with antibodies, they can't they can't get into the lock, so they cannot this virus is inactivated, if you will, is neutralized. It cannot enter and if it cannot enter a cell it cannot reproduce and make more viruses so it's been effectively neutralized um, antibodies can also, also activate complement which produces optimization so that enhances phagocytosis which is the eating of the white cells and white cells eating the bacteria and the viruses and stuff like that it also uh, complement activation um, will produce chemotaxis inflammation or lysis which is rupture like this uh, in target cells or antigens and stuff. So chemotaxis is the, uh, the attraction of white cells to the area by uh, release of chemicals. We covered what inflammation was, redness, swelling, heat, and all of that to uh, localize, the, um, localize the battle, basically. And then lysis is that rupture of the bacterial cell and stuff. Stimulation of changes in areas that help prevent the spread of pathogens um, by causing inflammation is the last of the antibody actions. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the different types of immune responses. Uh, when B or T cells become activate, activated the first time, it is called a primary immune response, after which some cells uh, remain as memory cells. So that the first time you ever see a virus, especially when it's a novel virus, just like this new you know, coronavirus, uh, that was part of the problem is we had never seen it before, so nobody had any kind of memory um, immunity to it, and everybody is, you know, that's encountering it is producing a primary immune response. So after the same antigen is encountered again, the memory cells can mount a more rap rapid and generally longer lasting response, and that is called a secondary immune response. That first, that primary response takes days and days to have, and even like a, really a month to really be full on, right? And uh, so it takes time, but then again, the second time, the reaction is swift and strong and um, really generally prevents you from having any kind of symptoms. Um, so immune responses can be classified, um, it's more like a practical act cl classification in several ways. So you have naturally acquired versus artificially acquired. So naturally acquired are part of everyday processes of life, such as getting sick, right? Artificially acquired are through a medical procedure. And then active immunity is when the you have the whole process I explained to you that happens. So the antigen is encountered, it's presented, it activates the cytotoxic T cells or the B cells or, you know, all of that process happens, okay? Whereas passive immunity uh, is when preformed antibodies are given to the patient, to the person, that and that those antibodies provide protection, okay? So if you have naturally acquired active immunity, it's basically getting sick. It's a natural process and it activates your immune system. Um, so you, you, you got a cold, you got the flu, you know, you got sick and you, and then you fight off the, the, the sickness, the antigen, the pathogen. Okay. Artificially acquired active immunity occurs through the use of vaccines. So it is a medical procedure where they give you part, the antigen 
so that your body can see it, go ahead and mount that primary response. Um, that pathogen is usually inactivated, so it can't cause infection, but it, it does cause an immune response. Uh, and as if you're uh, exposed to a larger dose of it later through everyday life, then you actually should have already have immunity and not get sick. So vaccination is artificially acquired active immunity. Artificially acquired passive immunity involves injection of gamma globulins or injection of preformed antibodies. So it's an antiserum and is short lived. Those um, antibodies only last uh, if if they're not made by your own white cells. If you're given to them as an infusion, as a medical procedure, right into your arm, um, then they will last a few months. Uh, but they can be really good and protective. So uh, an antivenom would be an example of that artificially acquired passive immunity. If you follow the coronavirus stuff and saw where they were infusing plasma of some of the people that had recovered from coronavirus to really sick patients and it helped them, is because um, the antibodies were able to come in and neutralize the virus uh, and the person didn't have to themselves form or uh, go through the process of forming all their own antibodies. Um, and then lastly, you have naturally acquired passive immunity. So um, that is uh, antibodies that are passed from mom to baby. Well, mom to fetus and mom to uh, newborn. Uh, it is short-lived, uh, but is um, protective for as long as the baby is breastfeeding, that baby is protected against everything that the mama is protected against through those antibodies. So um, very, very beneficial. The longer you breastfeed, the more your baby is protected, or for the longer the baby, your baby is protected. So uh, again, match up the type of immunity to um, the scenario there, to the action. Um, and so let's talk a little bit more about immune responses. So allergic reactions, if you will, are inappropriate immune responses to things that are normally harmless. And it's usually an excessive immune response. Uh, and it can lead to tissue damage, uh, etc. So an immediate reaction allergy is an inherited ability to overproduce the IgE antibody. Uh, and usually it's things like asthma and hay fever and all of that. Those are immediate reaction allergies. So that as soon as you're exposed to the trigger, whether it's pollen or uh, dust or grass or whatever it is, as soon as you are exposed, you get a reaction, okay, within 30 minutes. During allergic reactions, your mast cells release histamine and uh, prostaglandin D2 and leukotrienes, and that produces a variety of effects, such as the construction of the airways, the, uh, the runny nose, itchy eyes, the sneezing, and all that kind of stuff. Allergy mediators sometimes flood the body, resulting in what we call anaphylactic shock. So that's um, the allergic reaction gone like extreme. Uh, so it's a severe form of immediate reaction allergy and it can be life threatening. And um, epinephrine is a good antidote to that, but it is also short term. So if uh, anybody goes into anaphylaxis, you can give them a shot of EpiPen, but you've got to get them to the ER. A delayed reaction allergy uh, results from repeated exposure to substances that can cause inflammatory reactions in the skin. The typical delayed reaction allergy is your exposure to poison ivy or poison oak. Uh, and so remember, when you, if you've ever had that or seen somebody had it, uh, they don't really, you don't really see the reaction until 24 to 48 hours later. And the last slide, or almost last slide, is transplant and tissue rejection. So um, a transplant recipient's immune system may react uh, with the foreign antigens because they're not his or hers on the surface of transplanted tissues causing a tissue reaction, uh, uh, rejection reaction. So that is why we try to closely match uh, donor and recipient so that we can fool the immune system into thinking that the transplanted organ actually belongs there. And so um, so the, the antigens that are matched are the MHC antigens. And um, you can also, so try to, we try to match those as close as possible, but you can also use immunosuppressive drugs that can reduce uh, the chance of a rejection. Uh, but then the problem is you're suppressing the immune system and then you're more susceptible to infections, right? Uh, so, but if it's needed, that's what we do. And then um, 
Um, there's also a specific case um, where you have to um, think about it in a spray versus host disease where the um, transplanted tissue is bone marrow. So the tra what's transplanted is the immune system. And the risk there is that the transplanted immune system recognizes the entire body of the host, right? That it got transplanted in as foreign and it attacks, it attacks the entire body. That's graft versus host disease. And it can be fatal, obviously, because you're, the, the immune system is steadily destroying the, the entire body. And now let's talk about autoimmunity. So in autoimmune disorders, the immune system manufactures antibodies against some of its own antigens. So they're autoantibodies. So antigens uh, like um, your thyroid or um, parts of um, receptors on your muscles and stuff like that. And um, uh, cytotoxic T cells that destroy, that can destroy, for example, the um, thyroid tissue or um, nervous tissue or other things like that. Um, Autoimmune disorders, so it's basically a misdirected immune response against your own tissues, against yourself, uh, instead of uh, against a pathogen. Uh, so we do see that there are um, some autoimmune diseases that are the result from a viral infection, and there's something about the proteins on a virus that looks like the host tissue. And so it basically... Um, mimics, uh, it, it, it mistakes the, the tissue, the healthy tissue for the virus and attacks it thinking it's a virus. Um, there's also, it can also be due to faulty T cell development uh, or uh, again, reaction to a non-self antigen that bears a close resemblance to a self antigen. So that's that molecular mimicry uh, is the theory that um, as a cause of autoimmune disorders. And uh, we have one question. I want you to list an autoimmune disease for me here. So any of them will do. So just find me an autoimmune disease and pop its little name in here. And then if you have any other questions about this chapter, and um, you know, feel free to put them in there. And I appreciate your attention.